you to come with me to Acts chapter 10 this morning. This will be our final uh, week for a while in the book of Acts. Some of you may be thankful for that because we've been here for a while now, but it is, uh, uh, we're going to take a break and do some other things. And so uh, this uh, is a, an opportunity for us to continue in chapter 10 just to see a little bit more. And so a little bit of recap, you know, when you watch those series on, on your computer or whatever, before the next episode starts, they maybe do a little recap of what happened in the last episode. So um, last Sunday, uh, let, <clears throat> we, we had part one of this, and so let me do a little recap so that you're all primed and ready to go uh, for today's episode. And you you never know when one of my sermons can be classified as an episode because it can happen. So uh, if I were to describe one word or give one word that describes the chapter, in my mind it, it would be the word further. That the gospel is going further than it had been and uh, there are some preparations that are happening for that and and, and we said that God is preparing his people for the, the furtherance of the gospel. So God is preparing his people, and uh, we, we talked about that from the earlier part of the chapter, verses 1 through 16 specifically, um, and we heard about a guy, Cornelius, whom God was preparing to hear the gospel message. Uh, he's someone who feared God and uh, understood uh, a number of things about God, but did not know Jesus. And so, in a vision, God was uh, preparing him uh, for that, and so told him, hey, you, you need to go and find Peter and get him to come, and there's going to be some things that happen. So, one of the things that we talked about was the fact that uh, God is preparing people to hear the message of the gospel. And what that means on a practical level is that every time you have a conversation with someone, uh, someone who does not know the Lord, then you could be a part of the work that God is doing. We need to just kind of mentally in our mind realize, oh, God may be very much at work in, in this person's life. And so as you talk to them, even if, it's, even if you're not, in a sense, formally sharing the gospel in whatever the context is, uh, you are a part of that work that God is doing. And so that's a, a helpful thing for us to remember, even as we have casual conversation with people. But not only is God preparing the, the hearts and, and the lives of the people who will hear the message, he's also preparing the, the people who will share the message. And that uh, got us to talk a little bit about Peter and his vision that he had and, and a pretty um, incredible vision that is described for us in this chapter. And it was repeated for him. And Peter was beginning to understand that the gospel would go further than simply the Jewish people. And uh, up until that point, primarily it had been amongst the Jews, but and, and those uh, with a Jewish connection, and, and now it's going to go further, much, much further. And so God is preparing Peter for that, and as part of that, there's a shift in, in his thinking that the, the clean and the unclean, the certain aspects of, of the Jewish law uh, that were there for a time period, that were there for a certain group of people, uh, that God was shifting the focus away from that uh, because who is the one who the law points to? Well, it's Jesus Christ. And so there's a shift now from the external components of the law to uh, uh, believing in our heart and internally about the person of Christ. So there's a shift that's going on. Peter needs to pre be prepared for that. And so... Uh, he, God is doing that work. So the cool thing is, as God is preparing his people then, he will bring the two together. So you've got the person who's going to hear, you've got the person who's going to share, 
and uh, they may be miles apart, as is in the case here initially in our chapter, but in God's timing, in God's sovereign will, he brings these two people together for this divine moment where that good news is shared. And so we're going to talk a little bit then today about not so much the preparation that we talked about last week, but more now the actual proclamation of that gospel message and, and where that goes for us. So we've already had uh, Glenn read a, a good chunk of this portion for us in Acts chapter 10, but let's just notice a few things. First of all, and I'm not necessarily going to follow in sequence here, but I would like us to, uh, beginning at verse 34, um, I'm going to first of all look at the chunk that describes the gospel, and I'm going to be rereading some of what has already been read, but what I want you to be looking for as I read these verses it are the various aspects of the gospel that we hold dear to our hearts today, because that is what is being shared. Uh, this is not a uh, a recipe of, of how to make a gourmet meal that is so important that the world must hear. It, it's not some uh, great secret that worked for someone to uh, achieve success in this world, even though it certainly um, is a part of, of what is being talked about here. But the, the, the message that is so important to be communicated is the gospel message. So I'm going to begin reading now at verse 34 and, and following, okay? 34 and following. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now we're going to come back to those two verses in a little bit. As for the word that he sent to Israel, so this is Peter speaking here, preaching good news. Now, if you're looking for components of the gospel, notice what it is referred to as. It is good news, and that, that literally is what the word gospel means. Preaching good news of peace uh, through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And you know yourselves, you yourselves know what happened through it all, Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Now, uh, if you're looking for uh, identifying markers here that relate to the gospel, uh, we see the, the perfect Savior who is doing good and who's healing. And we see those who are oppressed by the devil, and it, it is um, uh, referring not just to those who were demon-possessed or, or uh, those who were affected in that way, but to the sinfulness of all mankind here. And then it says, for God was with him. We are all witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death. Is that, is that part of the gospel, the death of Christ? Absolutely. By hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day. Is the resurrection part of the gospel? Absolutely. And made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach, so there's the sense in which uh, God is calling others to carry on this message to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. So it speaks of Christ as judge here and pointing forward to his future return as well. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him is belief in, in the work of Christ um, part of the gospel message? Absolutely. It receives forgiveness of sins. Is that a part of the gospel message? Absolutely. Through his name? Amen. Can you see it there? Clearly, he is speaking the good news of Jesus. That is the message 
that is worth proclaiming. You can look throughout all of Scripture and see various aspects to the gospel. You know, sometimes we put it in a four-point formula or something that way, and, and we have our own little ways maybe of thinking about the gospel or sharing it, but you, at its core, you will see the work of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf because of our sinfulness we are in desperate need of help desperate need of forgiveness and we are lost in our own sin but jesus has rescued us he has truly done what was needed for us to make peace for us to be at peace with the father and it is only through christ that is the good news of the gospel. That is what everything focuses on here. This is not a self-help group. This is not a let's just get together and try and fix all of the problems of the world from a human standpoint. This points to the spiritual need that we have to know Jesus. That is the message that is laid out here and not just in this chapter but in all of scripture so that is the message that is going to be proclaimed well what kind of things do we have happening around that then if the if the good news of jesus christ is the centerpiece and everything else fits around that then what are some of the things that are happening as the gospel is is going to be proclaimed um, uh, while it is being proclaimed and after it is proclaimed, okay? A bit of a before, during, and after if you want a bit of that uh, outline for, you, for your help this morning. So let's look at, at a little bit of what's going on in this case beforehand. Come with me in Acts chapter 10 back to verse 22 for a minute. Acts chapter 10 and verse 22. Talking here again about Cornelius. They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you, talking about the fact that Peter would come, for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So just notice in that verse that because of God being at work in Cornelius' life, God has let him know that Peter has something to say, and so he wants to hear it. There's some anticipation that comes. Now, um, not just verse 22, but notice verse 24. Verse 24, and on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So, Not only is Cornelius expecting something good to happen here, but he wants others to be there as well. And who does he invite? The people that he knows well. The people that he knows well, his relatives and close friends. Stephen talked in Sunday school about about friendship and community. Um, You will never have a greater impact on anybody than you will have with those that are your family and your close friends. The greatest impact that you will have for good or for bad are on those that you know and who know you. Usually those right within our own home those that are very close to us. Do not underestimate the power and influence that you have in their lives, for good or for bad. And so I think it is significant, as Cornelius is is in, in anticipation of what is to come, this is a God thing, and Cornelius understands that, There's an important message that's going to be shared, and so he doesn't want to experience it alone. 
He wants to experience this with the rest of his family and friends. So just a, just a reminder there for us that those that God has placed in our lives are extremely, extremely important. You know, um, when we were talking a moment ago about being thankful, um, and, and as we think of family and friends, man, I hope we are thankful for those that God has blessed us with. So you will never have a greater impact uh, than on those that are close to you in that, in that sense. Uh, jump with me to verse 33. 33. So I sent for you at once, and have been, uh, you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So again, we see this sense of anticipation and expectation that Cornelius has. You know, uh, God told me that uh, we needed to connect, he says, and through this vision. And so he brings the right people together. And now he says, we're ready. We're ready to hear it. Uh, just, like, just like Glenn here in the front, he's, he's right here and ready to hear whatever I have to say this morning, right? And same with all of us, we're just anticipating. And, and in the same way, uh, the gospel message was about to be proclaimed, and, and God had been at work in Cornelius' life preparing him, and so there was that expectation and anticipation there. Now, now you're probably thinking, boy, some of the people that I've shared the good news of Jesus with, they have not been too excited to hear it. They have not been anticipating what I have had to say. As a matter of fact, they, they're trying to run the other way, and as I chase them, I quickly share uh, the good news about Jesus. Well, we do need to be sensitive to where people are at, uh, but there is a sense in which God is preparing for certain individuals to hear. And if you've spent much time talking to people, you probably can tell that difference between someone who has a sincere interest and a desire to hear and to learn and others who have already made up their own mind and choosing not to accept that message. And so we simply have to be um, open to the Lord and seeking to uh, walk with Him in it. And uh, it, it doesn't always, um, it's not always easy to discern uh, exactly at what stage a person is at in, in whether they are willing to hear. And so we simply need to be faithful and stay close to the Lord in this. And certainly a uni unique situation that's being described here, but clearly he was ready. He was ready. And some of you have spoken with individuals who as well have been very ready, God at work, and they they come to faith in Christ and there is a glorious transformation. Praise God. So there, uh, beforehand, there can be uh, this sense of anticipation of what will be shared. But then we also see that as the message is being shared, part of that message is that the gospel is for everyone. And that's where uh, we already read verse 34 and 35, but, but this is so helpful for us to remember that the gospel is that which is for all. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, no, there's no favoritism with God that though he may work in certain individuals in a particular way at a particular time, there, there is this message that is uh, true, and, and that is that God desires all to come to faith in him. And so in every nation, verse 35, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, um, 
This is not telling us that, there, that if you just be good, you will be accepted by God. No, it, it, you have to read the, the rest of it, which tells us that we, we need Christ, that that's why he has come. And, and we are not able to be good in our own uh, strength. And so we need him. But there is this uh, reminder that no one is too far gone to receive the good news. There is hope for everyone. This is especially significant when uh, at this point it was primarily a Jewish gospel and, and now it is clearly being um, opened to the entire world. And that is, you know, you and I can be thankful for that, and we've already heard mention of that um, this morning. The gospel is for everyone, and we seek him. Notice verse 43, which touches on the same thing. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You see the emphasis on the inclusivity of the gospel that all the prophets speak to this one thing that is that good news and and that is available to all all of scripture points to that good news of Jesus which is available to all of mankind and that is the truth and so this is helpful for us uh, to be mindful of as we share, as we live, as we interact with other people, you know, and, and um, we, we could have a whole discussion on, on uh, those that come from other cultures, other backgrounds, those that speak a different language, those that have a different color of skin, all of these things, you know, and so the all means all. It's, it's inclusive, it's open to everyone, no matter what a person's background is, No matter uh, what they have or haven't done, the gospel is for all. Then quickly, because time is fleeting, we want to look at the response. So Peter shares this gospel message. And uh, afterwards, how do people respond? What is it that we're hearing? Well, look at verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Okay? Notice that um, there is, uh, they they heard it. It means that they didn't just hear it in their ears, but they heard it in their heart. It it sunk down deep, and it was not uh, simply... Okay, I, I heard what he was talking about, it uh, made sense, um, but no sense of commitment to it. In that phrase, they, they heard the word there, it, it's implying that there was true uh, a commitment then, that they were, they were embracing the message, they were receiving it. And the Apostle Paul speaks of uh, many individuals who, who did the same thing. They, they heard the word, not as it were just the not as if it were just the words of men, but the, as it really was, the word of God. And it's almost like the messengers in the background then, and it's, it's God who they have heard from. So <clears throat> the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. So they heard, embraced, God uh, was doing a work amongst them. They received the Holy Spirit. Notice that this is very similar to uh, Acts chapter 2. And so what we've got is uh, the gospel in Acts 2, primarily to a Jewish audience uh, from different backgrounds, even there, different culture, even there. But uh, now the gospel going to a new people group. uh, And so we see some of the same evidences that initially were a part of that original moment. And we see some kind of the same thing repeated here for the Gentiles. So God at work in this way. So they receive the Holy Spirit, and uh, there are evidences of God at work there, the speaking in tongues and the incredible praise that is is happening. 
And so there is a response. But there's another response that's kind of interesting to note as well. And if you look at verse 45, there's another response here. The believers from among the circumcised, so among the Jewish people, who had come with Peter, they they were taken along to see what would happen. They were what? They were amazed. Probably kind of surprised. And, And... they might have been thinking, we, we thought that this good news of Jesus would, would only be for us. They might have thought that. And they might have thought that, well, even if it is for others, that, that they would have to do everything that we do, thinking of the law and so forth. But no, there is a shift in thinking. And we saw some of that with Peter's vision. But now we're seeing that... Uh, This has created surprise uh, and amazement amongst the Jewish believers who already know Jesus, but they realize they don't have the corner on Jesus. They have a very important role to play, but there are others who are a part of this grand plan of God. And again, we can be so thankful. If you want a portion of scripture that helps us understand um, the Uh, gospel being offered to the Jewish nation, but then because of their primary rejection of that message, it being opened up to the Gentiles, where would you go in Scripture? You know what I'm going to say here. There's three chapters that explain this probably better than any place else in Scripture. Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11. Yeah, just do a little background in there and, and it will help you kind of put this shift together of what has been happening and what is happening, okay? Romans 9, 10, and 11. Now, surprise and amazement. So we've looked at before, during, and after. Let me leave us with just three uh, hopefully practical thoughts here that uh, will guide us as the gospel goes further. As the gospel goes further, number one, I would say that God is is wanting all of us to, to reach out to others who may be different than us. I know I already said that our primary and our biggest influence will be amongst uh, family and close friends, that, as was mentioned here. But that doesn't mean you stop there. And if we stop there, then the gospel would never go to the ends of the earth, would it? And so we want to continue to reach out. We want to continue to move beyond our comfort zone. Beyond just others who are like us in various ways. So be willing to be a part of that. Be willing. Number two, I would say the gospel must be central to who we are and what we do. The moment we move away from the gospel is the moment we lose our meaning as believers. And uh, the the world is, is very quick to jump on a particular bandwagon and gather support uh, on one particular issue or another. And I would encourage us not to be issue-oriented, but to be gospel-oriented. And lastly, get out of the way. What on earth? Get out of the way. For our last uh, reference in our Acts study for the moment, we will come back to the later chapters at a future time, but for the present, for the last uh, thing I want you to notice, chapter 11 and verse 17. Chapter 11 and verse 17. And this is Peter as he is reporting back to the church about what has taken place. And in verse 17, he says, If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I 
that I could stand in God's way. And so Peter knew, he understood that if, if he were to ignore the vision that God had given him and, and just resist that and say, no, no, uh, we, we cannot change uh, the way it has been and uh, the gospel is for the Jews only, if he had stayed in that frame of mind, then he would have been going against God. And as we mentioned, uh, God has promised that the gospel will go further. He says, I will build my church. You will be my witnesses. There, there is this sense of, of divine command and obedience. The gospel will go further. Do not impede its progress. Do not get in its way. There's an old, an old gospel song that um, is called Gospel Train. Choo, choo. And you may remember some of the words because it's primarily today more a kid's song than anything, but the gospel trains are coming. I hear it just at hand. I hear the car wheel rumbling and rolling through the land. Get on board, little children. Get on board, little children. Get on board, little children. There's room for many more. And it's the idea that, that this message of the gospel is, is this uh, chug, chug locomotive. And it's on the move. And it's, it's going to accomplish God's purpose. People will be drawn to him. People will respond to him. Not everyone. Many are going to choose to reject. And, and they will stand in judgment and have to give account for their decision. But the gospel train is that which continues to move forward and to advance. And you and I are blessed and privileged to be a part of that. And I would say to you, if you're not on the train, you best get your bags packed and they're coming. There's room for many more. The gospel is open to all. Come on board. But if you are choosing to not receive Christ then just know that that locomotive is going to keep on trucking. It's going to keep on going. The gospel cannot be stopped. It is good for uh, us to understand that perspective from God's word. And so I close this morning with the challenge. You know, are you uh, a part of this gospel train and are you willing to help others to come on board and that seems to be the message that we see as we observe Acts chapter 10 let's pray together Lord we thank you that we've been able to take this time today we ask that in your sovereign plan that you would continue to draw people to yourself that it would not be to a scheme or to a man-made plan, but that it would be, uh, we would place our trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Lord, that precious story of salvation is dear to our hearts. Lord, I pray for each one of us as we seek to uh, live out the gospel to those around us that you would receive honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.